Let's see. Got that one, got that one. Well, y'all, it's the last day of class. Isn't it exciting? We made it. Even if it was barely, we made it. So we'll wait maybe five more minutes, and then I'll finish up the rest of Black Lives Matter and talk a little bit about the final exam and then answer any questions you may have. Does that sound like a game plan? Yeah. Okie dokie. So let's see. I will just mute that for now. Got those two. Not really a long history either. Admit. Let's see. We have those two. We have those two. Copy image. Making all these last minute changes. All right, let us get back into it. All right, so you make sure this share is proper. All right, everybody can see the slides. Cool, all right, we can see the slides. All right, so where we left off on last week, I was talking about why should we care about mass incarceration? And I was talking about the uh, privatization of jails and prisons, uh, the racial disparities in crime classification and sentencing, and then ultimately the uh, larger long-term consequences for imprisoned poor people, uh, people of color, and then as well as their communities. The biggest ones being uh, housing loss, 
uh, exclusion from the labor market, uh, political disenfranchisement, and smaller dating pools. I forgot to mention in particular for uh, political disenfranchisement, while uh, California recently uh, voted to allow prisoners to actually vote, uh, Florida in recent years, actually recent months, have uh, increased. So as a result of the more people are, who is guy now? Anyways, uh, people trying to, uh, well, not people. In 2018, it was voted in Florida to allow uh, former felons to give them back their right to vote. But the Florida government is increasing like the number of requirements or uh, hoops, if you will, to allow those former uh, felons to actually get their right back to vote. Uh, some critics have argued that these new fees and other requirements that these people have to meet is uh, similar to the hoops, and in particular, the uh, poll taxes that were enacted during, during Jim Crow. That's what I was trying to say. So that's where we were. And so... I wanted to ask you all the following question, if it would let me move my slide forward. All right. So is black distrust, distrust, of course, in the legal system influencing the way the government treats black people? So in other words, do you think African-Americans relationship with the criminal justice system is a dysfunctional and cyclical one? So as a result of long-term, I guess, socialization, Black people's socialization about the system, don't trust the system, the system is out to get you, and then we get involved in the system, and then, of course, the system treats us badly. Is this more so like a self-fulfilling prophecy or just what? Not all at once. Oh, Mallory raised your hand. You could have just talked. Um, and some I always mix up in some of my classes. We have to raise our hand, and I keep mixing up like what, like the what the protocol is from my classes, but, um... I was just like, what is raising hand? I didn't know you could raise that I hand. I didn't know you could until, like, two days ago. Um, I don't, I'm not, I don't think it's a self-feeling prophecy, but, like, I feel like the distrust is, like, it's valid, but I think on the side of, like, the government and, like, definitely white people are, like, there's, like, people in there, like, like, well, I don't know why you would act like that. If you're, like I don't know why you're gonna act suspicious if you aren't like trying to hide something. You know, like how people are like, well, I don't know why you would act like this unless you're trying to hide something. And it's like, well, you know, the like the government isn't like hasn't always been great towards everybody. So it's like I don't really know how to explain it, but it's like it's not like the government is neutral towards everybody. So I think a lot of people think that, but. Not entirely true. Not true at all, actually. So you're saying that the government, well, not the government started it, but the government, unequal, uh, yeah, unequal, uh, yeah, we could say, yeah, unequal treatment of people of color, in particular African Americans, has fueled, they started it. Yeah. Let's say the rest of you. Nobody else? Nobody? Oh, Mallory, I did get a Cherie's, uh, what's it called? It's the other Funko Pop people, so I'm excited. Eventually, I'll show that at the end of class. Like, I got oh, them. Uh, yeah, I got them on clearance. Some of the things that you should not do with your stimulus check money, I did. I'm going to buy all the stuff. Yeah. So... Oh, I forgot. I did have like a starting video. It still relates. So it's like going off of what you were talking about, about 
uh, white's view of the system, as well as Black Lives Matter. I do have a video from CNN. They did like a town hall meeting and pundits were actually asking African-Americans why they thought Black Lives Matter was not a, was a non-racist movement. So we shall do that just as soon as it will allow me to, uh, oh yeah, you got to click new share. Uh. Understand that, but you're also not getting the point. So I think he was just very dismissive about it. Well, so we saw that video is about four years old. And in particular, a lot of things have happened in the last four years. Is Black Lives Matter, should Black Lives Matter still be a thing? Yes. Yeah. Why? Because they still don't matter in this country. They're still going to jail for minor drug charges and stuff like that and not being um because white people are making money off of like weed charges and stuff like that and they don't care i want to say since we've all been locked in the houses i haven't heard too many things about police brutality so i don't know if that's a good thing i think i think so one thing i i think in the video i i never will this doesn't really relate to like your question which i think i'll, I'll get to after but like I never understand when we talk about police brutality and like a, like a lot of white people will be like, I don't understand like when they're defending police, when they'll be like, well, they care. Well, they kill more white people. It's like, like, I don't understand that defense because I'm like, yeah. Like, why are you, why are you using police killing people as a, like, I just, I think it's so weird. I'm like, why are you using police killing white people as a defense like are you like happy with that like it sounds like it's weird but i don't know but i think i would yeah like black lives matter still is important because like i mean like everybody's supposed to be wearing masks and there's so many things about like either people are like i can't wear a mask like i'm not gonna people aren't just gonna let me walk in a store wearing a mask or like i don't know what city it was in but there was like police were like beating people on trains and subways because they didn't have masks on but it's like where are you supposed to get a mask when nobody's like how are you supposed to get a mask now whereas like in other countries they were like a police was like oh you don't have a mask like here i'll give you a mask and here they just drag you off and beat you it's like what the hell i wanted to go back to your first comment about uh, you were saying that uh, white people would say, like in response to uh, the police brutality, saying that police beat more white people or shoot more white people or whatever. What do you think, which should be the quote unquote proper response? Should we like be talking about the beating? Police shouldn't be beating anybody or? I mean, we definitely should focus on like, the racial aspect of it but I just don't really understand like the like how like what maybe it's just I can't I just don't really like I can't really understand someone's perspective when they don't like believe in Black Lives Matter but it's like I just don't really understand the whole like oh well police actually shoot more white people and it's like I just am like okay yeah like what like shouldn't you think that's a problem too but Apparently they don't. I don't know. It's I just don't get it. They do it to try to make like the point of Black Lives Matter minute. Like, oh, they're not killing as many black people as they say. It, it does like the I get what you're saying. It doesn't matter like how many black, white, brown, blue, whatever color you want to say, people. It's just the fact that they're killing people is problematic. I remember like the last time I taught this class, there was an all lives matter person and he used the argument that I just suggested. And I was like, that was probably the smartest rebuttal to black lives matter. Like, well, no, it's not that, you know, the, we should, at the end of the day, we should be upset that the police are using this type of treatment and enforcement. 
the police should not be beating on anybody, period. And I was like, you win this round. You win this round. But And I don't know if this will really add to this, um, but um, for the senior seminar paper I wrote, I talked about like the difference between All Lives Matter and Black Lives Matter. And um, the conversations that happen on Twitter um, between the two, you know, camps. Yeah. Um, so, like, All Lives Matter only talks really about police officer deaths and stuff like that. Liberty, get out of the way. Um, while um, Black Lives Matter talks about a wide range of, you know, things that are happening. Um, not just deaths, but, you know, the injustices that are happening. Um, so it kind of is just like manipulating the meaning of Black Lives Matter when people say all lives matter. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, I think, I think that's true. Cause like, I was like, I was thinking in like, all lives matter didn't exist until Black Lives Matter did so it's like obviously you guys didn't i don't think you really cared that much and you just kind of felt threatened by black lives matter so it's i think alexis made a pretty good point so can there be a white lives matter no no, no i think it already because, exists no because white lives have already been I mean, well, look at the KKK and um, all those type of people. Those are examples of white lives matter like type things. So Alexis is like, white lives matter has existed since. I'm trying to remember when the KKK was founded. I want to say it was in the 19, it was early 1900s. Like 1904. So yeah, white lives matter since 1904. It's a shame. Wait, this is not my Lipton tea. There we go. Lipton tea, and I drink it, but that's none of my business. Okay, so moving onward. Why won't you move, computer? All right, so I used to love this slide. And then, of course, since I last taught this class, Bill Cosby, <laughs> he in jail. <laughs> oh, but anyways... Uh, Dr. Mack, the KKK was founded in 1865. 18, so like, what, six months after uh, Black people were freed? Give or take? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's a conversation. That's a point. So yeah, Black, white lives mattered since 1865. That's really? Wow. And it was founded in Atlanta. It was founded in Georgia. I want to say the first, if not the Tennessee, first. Tennessee, then Georgia. Okay, because I know that the uh, Stone Mountain, Stone Mountain, is one of the biggest hot spots for the KKK. They consider that whole mountain, that whole monument, to be very special in the KKK. But let's go back to talking about pound cakes and Jello pudding pops. While one Cosby is in jail, uh, but prior to that, uh, Bill Cosby's infamous speech on pound cake is uh, considered to be one of the first Black elite uh, discussions on Black cultural dysfunction in the 21st century. So I have that speech, and then it like would lead into basically discussions as to why ultimately the politics of respectability, as well as cultural dysfunction, uh, these arguments that ultimately uh, assert that it's Black dysfunction in particular that is actually fueling uh, mistreatment of African Americans by the carceral system as a whole. So by the criminal justice system as a whole. It's not that the system, the system is problematic, but when African Americans who are coming from disadvantage are oppressed, are are marginalized and they uh, partake in activities that are just as damaging, they are also then coming into the system at a dis disadvantage and are 
coming in to become far more likely to be abused by the system. So let us listen to the infamous pound cake speech. It's a really hilarious, it's not a hilarious speech, but let's see, there we go. Da, 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 da. Anniversary of the Brown versus Board uh, Supreme Court decision. So, of course, within that speech, you could hear uh, Bill Cosby trying to uh, promote and reinforce accountability, Black accountability, meritocracy, uh, justification of the treatment of African Americans, the few uh, sad ones that do ultimately get involved in the criminal justice system or get shot and killed, as well as talking about the uh, politics of respectability. Um, let's see, race scholars and public intellectuals and uh, empathetic white pundits had a heyday when this speech came out. Like, I remember, yeah, I was in the was eighth grade getting ready to go to high school, but like I remember hearing discussions about this pound cake speech on BET and like in the news as a whole. Uh, Michael Eric Dyson, a sociologist at Georgetown, he got tenure from analyzing the pound cake speech. Uh, back during that time, Dyson argued that uh, Cosby had built up years of, uh, main, of mainstream credibility by ignoring race in his comedy routines and in all of his television programs. Uh, but then he made the decision, Cosby made the decision with this pound cake speech to address issues of race by chastising poor Blacks rather than defending them. Uh, Dyson argued that by blaming low-income Blacks for not taking personal responsibility, uh, Cosby is ignoring white society's responsibility in creating uh, the problems he wants poor people to fix on their own. Uh, and then also in response to this, uh, in response to Cosby's speech, Cornell West uh, received his second or third national spotlight. Uh, let's see, what else was I was gonna say? Oh, I didn't even ask you all, what did you think of the speech? Before I saw the slide, I just kept thinking of how elitist of a conversation that was. Um, and how, I, I don't even know. I just really thought it was an elitist like a, a classist argument that he was making, if that makes sense. No, um, what do you mean? I guess now that I gave a little bit of the explanation, so you're saying it's like, here's an elite speaking at an event with other elites talking about individuals who don't even have a seat at this table or who cannot even come to this event. Is that what you're like saying? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I second that. It's like a lot. The conversation was very much so. Um, I don't know if I would say elitist, but it was just very, very much so discounting um, the problems that poor Black and brown people could be facing that could um, prohibit them from being a part of those conversations and sharing their point of view. I think what Alexis Thomas, I, I agree with what Alexis Thomas is saying. Cause like, I wouldn't say it's just elitist. Um, I think there's a lot of like, how, like, oh, um, uh, I don't know what book he wrote about it in, but Tana Hasi Coates, I think he wrote about this speech. He wrote about definitely something that Bill Cosby said. And he was talking about like how he was like, no, this is not, he was arguing like it wasn't good that he said, I forget what exactly he said, but it was like, yeah, this is pretty much bullshit what Bill Cosby was saying. And he was I just like say, I want to say it's a, a little bit in Native Son, because he's like, he's only had like, what, two or three books, period. Yeah. So I don't remember which one it was. I find him problematic, but that's, that's not for this class either. But uh, anyways, what was I going to say? Oh, I remember. Uh, let's see. Now, just to be messy before I finish the rest of this point, now that Bill Cosby's in jail, you know, for all his Me Too shenanigans, does that 
remove any credibility or viability from his uh, pound cake speech? Or it's just as sketch then as it is now? Or is it as powerful now as it was back then? I think he definitely, his speech has definitely lost some credibility since he has um, went to prison. Um, I still don't think it, I still don't think it was appropriate for that. Con- that's a better, I feel like that's a better way to say it. I feel like it was just still very isolated and very cut off. And it just removed a lot of people from those demographics, not thinking about stuff that they face on a daily basis. But I just feel like him going to prison just makes like, I don't know how to say it. Cause like the Cosby show is still a very popular show. Like a lot of people still find it very funny. Um, but I don't know if it still knocks his credibility. Like some people will still support what he says and some people. So I don't know about that one. Well, I mean, you know, it was only the system. They threw Bill Cosby in jail because, you know, he was trying to buy NBC. Even though like every time I hear that Hotep argument, I was like, how was he going to buy Comcast Universal? Bill Cosby does not have that much money. I don't, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. But eh, what was I gonna say? If we were still, I don't know why this didn't come up when we were talking about blacks in the media. I guess at the time, black as fuck didn't come out yet on Netflix. But like, there are like so many conversations that I've, I've seen in the last seven days that are talking about how problematic black AF is on uh, Netflix. If you don't have Netflix or you aren't keeping up with it, uh, the creator of blackish, grownish, mixedish. Uh, create uh, has a new show on Netflix that is supposed to be loosely based on his current life and it has Rashida Jones Quincy Jones's daughter that uh, she is very fair-skinned and for the most part I think this is like the first time she's ever played a role in her, but basically played herself uh, the wife is mixed is of is biracial and there's a lot of black I don't want to say caricatures but engaging in a lot of not not all stereotypes but it's really driving home this wealthy black person lifestyle and all of those issues but it, yeah a lot of co- like a lot of uh pundits race scholars and others are co- commenting on the show saying it's problematic because it is further perpetuating negative stereotypes as well as uh, promoting stereotypes of mixed people. I don't know how did we get into this. Oh yeah, I know why. Because they were comparing Black AF to The Cosby Show. And it was also comparing like Grownish to what was it? A Different World. In the ways in which it's like whatever the creator of Grownish at all was saying, yes, we get it. You can't, you don't have to say black every 45 seconds. You don't have to engage in all these black, the black things to like communicate that, yes, you're black. This is a black show. We're talking about black things. When Cosby at all, when he did all of his shows, really didn't have to mention race. You just knew it was black. That's why. But is it that, that's it. Like, I don't feel like that's fair to compare the two. Like, I get what they're doing, but I feel like I don't think it's fair to compare the two because you got to think we're living in two different time periods from when, when did the uh, different world come out? What, the 80s? Uh, it went off in the 90s. Yeah, I think it came out like early 80s or mid to early 80s. So it's like, you got to think we were living in a different time back then than we are now. Like, race relations is more heightened and stuff people are more heightened about that stuff rather than back then it was like I know I'm black you know all that kind of jazz it's like Bill Cosby could get away with wearing a sweatshirt for Tuskegee and nobody would bat an eye they'd be like oh that's cool he's promoting HBCUs but now it's like blackity black 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 I have yet to see Black AF, I saw the uh, the trailer, and I was just like, hey, you got the baby. I like the box song, but that's all. Oh, what was I going to finish saying about politics of respectability? Oh, yeah, so there are scholars who actually believe in this and uh, support it. Uh, there's one in particular, uh, Marissa Parsons Davis. Uh, she argues that there was actually truth 
to Cosby's uh, pound cake speech. Uh, she cited that the strong roles of families in the community, in the church. Uh, and she also argued that uh, statistics, crime statistics have not changed since these, uh, since the speech was given. Uh, these stats include uh, homicide still being the leading cause of death for black boys between the ages of 12 and 19. Uh, also that one out of three black men between the ages of 20 and 29 are under some form of criminal justice supervision. And only 28% of black children are growing up in a household with their mother and father. Uh, let's see. There were also uh, black uh, activists, and, uh, grassroots level community leaders uh, who denounced the speech, but uh, no other uh, black elites actually came forward to support him or criticize him. So we didn't hear a peep out of Al Sharpton, Jesse Jackson, John Lewis, Coretta Scott King, nor Rosa Parks. And of course, for everyone that's taken other classes, other classes dealing with diversity or like within social justice or any other diversity classes, we've been taught that a silence indicates implicit support or of whatever was said and going on. So because we heard silence, that means they were in agreement. And so now, of course, politics of respectability, all politics of respectability is, is just attempts by marginalized, by oppressed people to police their own menu, their menus, police their own members and show their social values as being continuous and compatible with mainstream values rather than challenging the mainstream for its failure to accept difference. So the way that you would the way that you would see politics of respectability coming into play is especially as we uh, use this in the Black Lives Matter section is when you hear a person was shot. Well, what were they doing? Why were they there? What were they wearing? If we hear about like a person was assaulted or in particular a woman was assaulted, who like by her partner, what was she doing? What was she wearing? Why, you know, why? As opposed to, you know, what did the aggressor do? It's what did the victim do? And so let's see, other examples, other noteworthy examples. So it's, yeah, it's not just, uh, oh, it's not just uh, Bill Cosby. Uh, let's see, what else was I gonna say? Oh yeah, politics of respectability is practiced as a way of uh, attempting to consciously set aside to undermine uh, cultural and moral practices thought to be disrespected by the wider society, especially in the context of family and good manners. And so while it doesn't have to look like admonishing speeches from elites, it could also be spoken in a more encouraging way, but it's usually done by elites of a marginalized group speaking to other elites. You really don't see the politics of respectability taking place among the lower levels by other lower people. Even if it is in the lower sects, it's always a person that's slightly above that is highlighting the ills of the lower group saying, hey, we got to get it together. And so as always, I have other speeches in politics of respectability. Let me put the slides back up. It's always such a hassle to make sure that they work. From current slide. All right. Where did the slides go? Do we no longer have? All right. Can we see the slides? The Zoom slideshow. <sighs> okay. I want to make sure that everybody can see them. All right. So, what did you think of Obama's uh, politics of respectability? speech. I think it, I thought it was interesting that he mentions like structural causes and structural racism but then like deflects it really quick and only focuses on like personal choices. I thought it was also weird that he brought in people from other countries. Like, I, uh, I don't know. Was it a little bit more palpable than the Bill Cosby speech? 
for sure. That perhaps Obama gave us a little sugar to go with this quote unquote hard medicine. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's hard. The system is rigged, but it's not as rigged as it is for people from other countries. And guess what? They are getting up and above and beyond. So you better get with it or get lost. What was I going to say? It doesn't, well, I mean, yeah, like when I show this video in comparison to a Cosby speech, I've had a lot of students that say, but Obama's speech wasn't about the politics of respectability. I'm like, what you mean? <laughs> Wait, what, what countries did he mention again? I want to say he mentioned China. I know he mentioned Brazil. What? It's like, like, privileged people can come from those countries too. Like, I... And he just like assumed everyone from those countries. I don't know. Well, I mean, I want to say Brazil is still considered third world. And that's actually one I of can't the imagine the amount of debt that one dude he was talking about has, though. Facts. It's he went to Morehouse three like, times. Like, he didn't mention that. Yeah, he didn't graduate. Uh, what, what was that? Here with the, what, whatever that uh, billionaire was that paid off everybody's student loans, paid off their parents' student loans, paid off everybody's debt. Yeah. I mean, it's a good thing. Yeah, you graduated and Obama was your commencement speaker, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> Obama is your commencement speaker getting your debt paid off. Obama ain't out here paying bills. Obama ain't if got Obama that much money himself. He's going to be everybody's commencement speaker. Yeah, he was like Ohio State's commencement speaker when I was, yeah, like if I had walked for my master's, he would have been my commencement speaker for Ohio State. And I was just like, damn it. But yeah. But no, he's not paying for debt. So the interesting thing about the politics of respectability, this is this is not new. Like it's been in existence as long as the KKK, as long as linked fate but similar to Linked Fate, it was only really conceptualized. It was only given a title in the 90s. Uh, so let's see. So in fact, it was actually embraced and debated as far back as by Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, du Bois disagreed uh, in, Was in Booker T. Washington's argument of a Black will of uh, Blacks choosing to exclude themselves from the political process until they're literate, socially and economically similar to whites. However, with Du Bois' promotion of the Talented Tenth, he unconsciously endorsed the use of the politics of respectability. Uh, these Black elites for the Talented Tenth either met or exceeded white opinions of Black success, and their co-optation into the mainstream society would eventually trickle down to the lower Black masses. And so, you could also see politics of respectability if you like go back and reflect on the civil rights movement. Politics of respectability was all up in that, uh, especially with the uh, motivation behind Rosa Parks becoming the face of the uh, of the of the uh, boycotts of the bus Birmingham bus boy was that Birmingham or was that Mobile of the bus boycotts of oh, yeah the bus boycotts. Uh, let's see. As well, so of course, with the uh, bus boycotts, it was, I can't even remember the woman's name, it's like Claudette Bird, no, Clovina Bird. It's in a chapter, but the point was, originally prior to uh, Rosa Parks, there was a 15-year-old girl who was already arrested for refusing to give up her seat on the bus, and she was going to be the face of the movement, had been arrested, all that stuff, but at the last minute, they changed it from that 15-year-old girl to Rosa Parks because she was raped and became pregnant. And they did not want a teen mother being the face of the boycott. Uh, likewise, also within the civil rights movement, uh, the true mastermind, the true genius, the true organizer of all the noteworthy events, the uh, Freedom Rides, the March on Washington, uh, CORE, uh, everything that CORE did, yeah, the Summer of the Bus Rides, uh, was all organized by a gay black man by the name of Bayard Rustin. 
Of course, why do we not know about him as being like the face, the true planner of it? Because he was gay. And at one point in time for like six months, which is wild, just six months, he identified as a communist. And of course, during the 60s, in the height of the Cold War, you could just, nope, you could not have any communists involved in anything, even former communists involved in anything. And then of course, as we talked about in the with Black Women section, we talked about the role the national welfare rights organizations had within the civil rights movement in terms of sending participants, sending people to participate in the marches, et cetera, but the civil rights movement never really acknowledging the ills and struggles of single mothers and welfare recipients, their lack of access to those supportive uh, programs, et cetera. So this is, these are all examples of how the politics of respectability was all up in the civil rights movement. In fact, like I learned about all of those groups through all of my classes I took in black, yeah, in the black studies department at my undergrad. So like that was like, yeah, politics of respectability is a thing. Uh, but moving onward, let's talk about victimization versus villainization. So this is a similar two to two similar concepts related to the politics of respectability. So when we're talking about how issues and events are described in the media, especially as it pertains to people either being killed or committing atrocious crimes, be, yeah, being on the receiving end of an atrocious crime or committing oh, an atrocious yeah. crime, that you're either victimized or you're villainized. And so victimized. I'm talking about the process of becoming a victim by highlighting suffering, abuse, an unfortunate past, etc. Uh, villainization on the other end, it's just the frame, yeah, it's just the process of making somebody into the bad guy, to quote Nicki Minaj, so you want to make me the bad guy. So you highlight aggression, corruption, uh, per uh, perpetuation of an unfortunate event, participation in an unfortunate event, uh, like the first one that I just thought about, we talked about it a couple weeks ago, the black doctor that was arrested, uh, yeah, arrested by the cop in Florida while he was trying to uh, get his uh, COVID-19 supplies together because he was doing testing for the homeless for coronavirus and they arrested him. And then it like had recently come out that the person over like seven or eight years ago had been previously arrested, the doctor had been arrested for a gun charge and that that justified why he was arrested that like the last time. And of course everyone like flipped their tables because it's like the police officer wouldn't have known that. But uh, anyways, the media frame for villainization ultimately, not the media frame, ultimately for victimization or villainization, the media ultimately determines which narrative or which outline is used, uh, media frames that are usually for a state, yeah, for the media frame used by the assailant or the sufferer is ultimately determined by the party's adherence to or violation of the uh, politics of respectability. So depending upon where they are on the scale, if their past is kind of quote unquote sketch as it relates to respectability, you are far more likely to get the villainization if you adhere more so to the politics of respectability, you're more likely to become a victim. You could be uh, portrayed as a victim. And so I have a bunch of examples of in recent years of how that original, how that looks. So first one, Trayvon Martin. So I, yeah, immediately after his death, this was actually the original photos used of Trayvon Martin. So that's my right hand. So on the right hand side, the original depiction, uh, reports of Martin's death were accompanied by those two pics on the side. It is MySpace era pics with the grill, shooting the bird, with the money in his hand. And so like when I first heard about his death, it was those actually those two pictures. Because I remember reading it and I was just like, oh, that's unfortunate. That was a black kid that was killed. Okay, well, that's also a conversation because I grew up in that kind of stuff. So it was like, eh, all right. Uh, but and that, as a result, actually also originally alongside those pictures, his death was reported as a result of a run-in with a gated community security guard. That's how it was reported and that's how it looked. 
However, as time went on and the and like the details about his death and circumstances leading up to his death gained nas uh, national attention. Uh, Trayvon was then portrayed more angelic or martyr-like. Uh, he was shown more so the imagery used as what we see now, the classical depiction, wearing his Hollister shirt. Uh, there was actually a couple of times where they showed him when, from when he was younger and went, to, went skiing. And then, of course, the picture that we see that he took when he was at school, showing him rocking his hoodie because let's see that uh yeah that actually yeah he was wearing the hoodie when he was killed it's also sad like you could actually like look up you can see the crime photos which is i don't recommend doing that but whoo yeah and so like when you uh use that classical depiction alongside the crime photos it's how it further perpetuates the classical you don't want to call it the romantic version of his death but the classical imagery that's used now to talk about trayvon martin And so the second one, Michael Brown. Woo! So of course, Ferguson uh, went into the convenience store, was what, accused of stealing? And then it was ultimately shot and killed by a police officer? Okay, and so there's a classical depiction and then there's a counter media prediction. Uh, so the uh, Hawaiian punch picture is not Michael Brown. That is somebody else. That is not him but you could still see it floating around on the internet to this day saying that's Michael Brown, that he was a thug. It was all of that. And so, oh, let's see. They were also using, what was it? Also the screenshot from uh, the store when he was also in the store, they also used that photo as well as a counter, counter depiction of Michael Brown. Uh, let's see. Uh, I remember when actually when that situation happened too, and even if, yeah, and also like, you know, was he innocent because he may have been in a game? Anyways, uh, scholars argued that uh, Brown's initial depiction as a thug, uh, in addition to the uh, justified inhumane treatment of his corpse, because of course, remember when he was shot and killed, he was laid out in the street for almost three hours. They'd never covered his body or anything. It was wild. Uh, but they argued that the, uh, his disrespect of authority and then also seen in the treatment of his corpse, that ultimately uh, successfully villainized Michael Brown, saying like he, he, was, he deserved to have been shot and actually uh, allowed the cop, uh, Darren Wilson, to walk away a free man. And so like, and then of course you could recall Ferguson, Missouri, so many protests, actually considered not the epicenter, but one of the hot spots in Black Lives Matter in terms of like protesting, all that stuff. His death and the uh, treatment of that case led to the FBI, not the FBI, the Department of Justice investigating Ferguson, Missouri, uh, uh, learning that a lot of the police department's revenue came from ticketing African-Americans for speeding, fining, all of that stuff. And so there was like a racialized, racial discrimination as it related to uh, the treatment of African-Americans in the city. So, yeah. Another example of victimization versus villainization, Dylan Roof. Don't remember Dylan Roof. That was the guy that shot up the, uh, the Charleston, the Black Charleston Church. This was 20, God, 2015? Was it 2015? 2014 or 2015? Uh, so originally, so the Daily News in Florida called him a terrorist. You see his photos. Uh, this was all the way back, yeah, still currently more so. He's still, yeah, he's still in jail. But more so, as you can see from the Daily Beast, the same magazine now describes him as quiet and soft-spoken. I remember there were Reddit threads describing that ultimately he went on the uh, shooting rant because his ex-girlfriend left him for a Black person. And so ultimately that was like the reason why he shot up everybody. And so, oh, but originally I was going to say that Roof was going to, uh, was going to receive similar treatment as the uh, white man, actually this happened in 2015 too, that uh, killed the uh, Muslim students at UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, however, that person, they, de they declined to charge him with a hate crime. And so instead, just like that person, the uh, UNC Chapel Hill shooter, 
is being uh, portrayed as a mentally ill person. Uh, now they're also using that for Dylan Roof as well. But there has not been much prog progress made on Dylan Roof's case. So I don't know. I'm gonna, yeah, because like if it had been, they would have talked about it by now. Let's see, other cases. We all remember that shooting, that the, the dude that shot up the movie theater, the Aurora shooting. Uh, so originally when, gosh, what was that guy's name? James Holmes. When James Holmes was first arrested, when they found him, of course, they used his mugshot. He looked weird. He looked sketch. Uh, when he was first arrested, the media focused on his mental instability that, you know, he was suffering all types of mental diseases, disorders, etc. cetera. Uh, they described him as a tortured grad student. He was described as a brainiac who tragically decided to become a mass shooter. Uh, CNN aired numerous clips describing how his past is full of contradiction. They were trying to figure out exactly where did he go wrong? Uh, the Daily Mail reported that Holmes, uh, AKA the, uh, the Batman killer claims he had amnesia and actually doesn't remember firing into the crowded movie theater. And he actually complained in jail that the food that they were feeding him made his stomach hurt. However, recent uh, depictions of him uh, yeah, because ultimately Holmes was convicted of 24 counts of first degree murder, 140 counts of attempted first degree murder, one count of possessing uh, explosives, and a sentence enhancement of a crime of violence. And I don't think, I don't know, have they done the sentencing trial? But regardless of that, the tortured soul brainiac, uh, tortured soul, tortured brainiac frame still persists. They still describe James Holmes more so as a victim because there is a, docu a documented history of his mental illness. So I think at best, I would describe it as being ambivalent. It's like an ambivalent victimization of it. Uh, some media frames describe him as a cunning killer. Others describe him as a schizophrenic killer, a crazy person that was driven to commit a mass crime. And so, of course, then the last one, Sandra Bland, say her name, my God. So this was new, new. Well, not as new, but originally, let's see, when there were reports about Sandra Bland being arrested and killed, well, not killed. She, the official term is, is that she committed suicide while under custody. That's the, that's the uh, final conclusion for her death. Uh, she was arrested while on the way traveling to a new job. Uh, yeah, at Prairie A and M, Prairie yeah Prairie A and M University. Uh, she was pulled over in a traffic stop, which ultimately led to her being arrested. And then she was found dead while in police custody. Uh, the initial depictions of her showed her like her selfies, more professional type pictures. However. For the longest time, it was actually her photographs, her mugshot, all of that. But within the last, I want to say the documentary about her life came out in last year. Was it last year or year before last? So either 2019 or 2018. And so luckily, the uh, documentary, this is more so of the current depiction of her. And so the reason why it's really weird about why Sandra Bland is, you know, when you say, say her name, she's like the face of that as opposed to Black Lives Matter. And it's because uh, she exemplified the goal of uh, the politics of respectability. She wasn't a thug. She was not a negative Black stereotype. She was caught up in a traffic stop on the way to a new job at a university. And then, of course, there were reports about her militant, of her Black militant opinions on social media, and they were used as an attempt to villainize her and justify the uh, violence and circumstances that led to her death. Uh, so as a result, I wouldn't say that she was villainized. I mean, there was a small, a small attempt to try and make her appear villainized, but ultimately there were more things in her past that made her align more so or pass the politics of respectability test. So that's all of those. Let's see. And, and then ultimately what has happened since then, say her name, is not necessarily a subset 
of Black Lives Matter, but it's used for Black women or, uh, yeah, Black women, both trans, yeah, both what cis and trans identified uh, that are ultimately killed uh, either by or either by the uh, criminal justice system or as a result of discrimination, all that other stuff. And it's weird because it's like men, they'll get the full hashtag Black Lives Matter moniker, but women, Black women, on the other hand, don't. They get hashtags say her name, and it's uh, described as a way because Black women are not included in the larger discussions of Black Lives Matter or being, you know, listed as leaders or victims or all of that stuff, even though Black Lives Matter was created by three Black women. It's all very weird. Maybe one of these days I'll do a Black Lives Matter class. And so I ask you all, why are the politics of respectability so important? Do you think the politics of respectability, like, is that a thing for other minorities too? Like, do they have rules that they abide by, et cetera? What do you think? Here? Not all at once, y'all. Should the politics of respectability be a thing? I'm not a fan of them. So Mallory is like this, nope. I'm not a fan. They should not be a thing. I think I think it can work for like a little bit, but it's like I don't really know how to explain it. It's like you do respectability politics where like you have to try and be what they want you to be, then like I don't know, like I just don't see it. I don't want to like be throwing buzzwords around, but like I just don't see it as like being working towards like a liberation, you know? It's like I don't know. I guess if we like look at it as a power structure, the only uh, the only uh, politics of respectability perhaps is the frame or test by which the dominant power structure would acknowledge any wrongdoing that they may have done to the marginalized group. So it's like, okay, so you are this upstanding citizen and we still did you dirty. You know what? That was, you know, that was a valid error. You have every right to be upset. That was our bad. But, oh, oh, you used to do drugs? Oh, you used to be a drug dealer? Wait, you may have been a prostitute 20 years ago? Ah, no, you're sketch. No, 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 no. You were sketch. Not to say that what happened to you was deserving, but, you know, was deserved, but, you know, you shouldn't have been sketch. Do you think other groups have uh, politics of respectability? Like other similar rules so that they can appear to be uh, upstanding citizens for the dominant power structure, whatever that may be? Yeah. I'm trying to sit here and like try to uh like I don't know what that would look like for like the LGBTQ community. Do you think it's so oh, huh? I think for the LGBTQ community, that's like Pete Buttigieg, who's like, I'm gay, but I you probably wouldn't be able to like I'm not gonna be very upfront about it. Not that you have to be upfront about it, but he's like he definitely is like, Oh, you have to be gay in a certain way, like 
you you shouldn't talk about it that much and if you talk about it just keep it like sanitized and he's very much like respectability politics for the lgbtq community because he's like you guys can't be all crazy out like if he went to pride he'd probably be like this is too much um that's i think that's a good example for the lgbtq community so that that pete pete is the goal I mean, but I've read so many things that said like that the LGBTQ community did not like Pete because he didn't appear to be gay enough, which I was like, I don't. Yeah, yeah, because he was like. Well, I don't, I don't know if it's exactly like being. I think being gay enough is different from like. I don't think exactly they mean like being gay enough, but it's like he. He wasn't flamboyant. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I don't think it's exactly saying that you have to be, but I think it's like if somebody else was, he would be like, no, that's you can't do that in public. Very much like appear, like try to appear to be like as straight as possible. I can see that. I mean, but he was also in the military at the height of don't ask, don't tell. Like, yeah, I was going to say he seems like a don't ask, don't tell kind of guy. Yeah, he was in there when Don't Ask, Don't Tell was still a thing. And it's like, yeah. So, like, if he was found out, it would have been all bad. So, okay, so the LGBTQ community definitely abides by some type of politics of respectability. Do we think other racial groups and other ethnic minority groups, do they adhere by some type of politics of respectability? I'd be willing to say Latinos do. Especially as it relates to immigration. Yeah. Because, of course, believe it or not, like one of the first things, uh, if something happened to a person of La- of Hispanic descent or, like, or is Latino, they may ask, are they a citizen? Were they in the country legally or illegally? What was their status? How long have they been here? What were they doing? Oh, you've been here for 15 years and you never got around to doing your citizenship papers? Sketch. Or you hear about the kids in cages? Well, you know, they wouldn't be in cages if their parents didn't drag them. Sketch. Ultimately, the politics of respectability is just, it's problematic. But it's its essentially like just a, it's a litmus test. If you pass it, all right, then maybe we should care about your situation. If not, your sketch and anything that happened to you, though unfortunate, may have been, you know, the creation of your own doing of your own behavior. I feel like, I feel like there's, you could say like the respectability politics or the politics of respectability, like, reinforce power structures. And so, like, I don't... So, like, me and Paul one time were talking about, like, doing stuff for first-gen students um, for OWU. And I was, like, I think I was kind of pushing back with Paul, kind of, like, what, how he, like, wants us to... Not saying what he does is bad, but, like, teaching us to kind of navigate college and like kind of like assimilate to like academia and like middle class culture in general because I was like I was like not everybody's gonna want to do that and it's like personally I'm not a fan of like doing respectability politics of like I'm gonna appear to be well I guess you wouldn't say that I'm I guess you could argue that I do of like I'm gonna be I'm gonna do like WCSA I'm gonna be in all these things and do like try to make myself look like what like a good student quote unquote is supposed to look like in order for them to be like yeah we should do stuff like we should try to help out first gen students instead of like well maybe like the culture should change you know I don't think that makes sense but it's weird because while there are conversations or suggestions for the power structure to you know adjust itself to account and include 
the marginalized, it's always, well, yeah, especially as you've seen throughout this course, it's always the responsibility of the marginalized and the oppressed to catch up to the system, to come into the system, not for the system to allow them in. Damn, that's dope. I'm glad this was rec recorded. Yeah. Especially like, yeah, the respectability of politics reinforces the power structure. That was dope. You know what class we talked about this in? What class? In my English 150 class. We read Othello and Claudia Rankin, Citizen. And this is a lot of what we talked about. Because I'm like, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it really does. Like, it's not the responsibility of the power structure to accommodate for the marginalized or for the oppressed. It's for the oppressed to get with the system, not for the system to change. Why? Because the system is perfect. Y'all have to uh, get with the program, not the system. So what can we do? What are the solutions? How can we fix this system? Well, these are just some things that I suggested. So like, because I, I, I didn't even ask, like, what's the point of Black Lives Matter? Is it a movement? Like in comparison to the civil rights movement, okay, so we knew for the civil rights movement, we wanted integration. We wanted complete political enfranchisement. We wanted to, uh, yeah, in integrate public schools, integrate public spaces, uh, stop, you know, literacy tests, all that stuff, stop. I can't even remember we're discriminating at the ballot box, discriminating against education, all of those things. Clearly identifiable goals. What is the goal of Black Lives Matter? Yes, Black people, we matter. Um, I think the goal of Black Lives Matter is to... Um, this is a kind of a hard question. I think it's just... Like, what's the goal? Like, what, to, what's the end goal? I think it's to make our lives not necessary I don't know how to word it like, I have the thought but I think it's just to um help promote us and make these conversations about how black lives have not historically mattered still don't matter um to help us get seats at the table um whether that be in government business um local government whatever it may be so it's kind of hard to define fine because they really like i don't know it's just really kind of hard to define so black lives matter could, sounds like it could be partially an academic discussion or a pundit discussion black people we are not we are being mistreated and we don't have seats at all the tables that sucks are are we gonna get like is it then whose responsibility is to like try and push for black people to have seats at these tables. Where are these seats gonna come from? Is it is it BLM's responsibility to try and get these seats? Who is going to give the seats? Are we going to make our own seats? Are we going to steal other people's seats? Are we just gonna shut down the meeting? What's the goal? Or is it just nice to talk about, nice to wear on a shirt? Now, at least I was glad I was able to wear like my Black Lives Matter shirt at least one time to campus. I have a Black Lives Matter jersey. It's cute. So yeah, wear you know wear it on shirts. Have nice little stickers. Who are the leaders of the Black Lives Matter movement? Do we have leaders? Does BLM have leaders? Is it Sean King in them? Do oh, they? no. It's, it's not Sean King? It was King? two women. It was two women. It was not Sean King. Oh. It's not Sean King? You know, you know he's, he's asking for more money like he's i mean like we know he does all those fundraisers that like uh, the, they don't ever get the money but he's doing like another one right now and he wrote an email you know his emails like people send out their emails his like little newsletter he 
said, here's my personal cell phone number. Don't share it with anyone else. But he sent an email like to like millions of people that are subscribed to his email. And I was like, I follow a bunch of women on Twitter who are like, yeah, he is awful. It's a shame what that did we, we didn't have any happen? chance to talk about like transracial stuff because I'm like, well, you know, Sean King, <laughs> we would talk about a Rachel Dolezal. I would have talked about Sean King. Oh my God. Oh, it's a shame. Shh. We'll blame that on the coronavirus. What's the fact that Rachel Dolezal happened is so sad. Like, I think it's become accepted. What? It's become acceptable. How is it acceptable? She's white. Oh, oh my God. All of the people on Instagram that are black fishing. Oh, Goodness. did you see? Don't get um, me started on black posted, Someone posted, uh, I, was it Kylie Jenner? One of those people. And they were like, the coronavirus her, has her like turning white again because she has she can't have any like. No tanning. Uh, yeah. I was dead. So, like, yeah, it's it's become acceptable. Black fishing is a thing. When did black fishing become acceptable? The last time I checked, it's not okay. I don't know. Check check how many followers those people have. Yeah, I want to like retweet what Alexis just said. I've been asking the same thing. Like, it's a thing. <laughs> it's a thing. It's acceptable. If it wasn't a thing. Kim Kardashian at all, they would not be as dark and as tan, especially Kylie Jenner, who is not ethnic at all. But she's like almost as dark as one of my little cousins. And it's like, I just don't understand how do they not see it as problematic that they're tanning? Like, you have, I, I just have so many words. Like, I just don't understand. They literally should look in the mirror and understand that they are what, well, I'm sorry. They are, uh, uh, what is, ha, uh, dang it. I can't even think they're not even white. They're like, um, they're, they're, Armenian. Uh, they're, they're a white ethnic. Armenian or something, but still they classify as the white class. I don't see how they look in the mirror and then look at themselves tanned and be like, Oh, that's okay for me to do. Like to look like a light skinned black person. That's because uh, perhaps maybe uh, the power structures within the black society think it's cool. If they're getting messages and co-signing. It's it's not not okay. If the power structure says it's okay, it's okay. No, it is not okay. The uh, police officer, this was 2015, uh, that and in which uh, there was like a shooter and Dallas used the robot to uh, figure out where the person was and detonate and killed the person. Uh, she announced that she would was going to return back to her district to find out what really happened. Clearly, we never know what happened because that was like the last thing we heard about that situation. But you can rally and mobilize potential supportive politicians. I think ALC has expressed support for Black Lives Matter. I think John Lewis had too. Uh, you could also adhere to the politics of respectability as well as separatism. Uh, basically by addressing the social and cultural ills plaguing the Black community, Black youth will be less likely to challenge the cops or won't be in places or doing things that could be used by the cops and media to villainize or profile the individual. Like, no, 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 no. I mean, it's a potential. I always put that in there to be messy. And it's like, well, you know, if we weren't sketch, maybe things wouldn't happen. But of course, that's not necessarily the case because even black doctors get arrested for doing nothing. Are there any other ideas? Any other potential solutions? Is there is there anything else? Oh, and then of course, is Black Lives Matter the civil rights movement for for the millennials, for the Gen Zers? Is this our civil rights movement? Yes? No? This is not our movement? I just moved to get tenure. That's all I care about. No. Move for this awful semester to end. Sheesh.
So is this our civil rights movement or not? Or is this just a blip? I don't know. We don't we don't know what this is. I'm trying to think about how many faculty do I know that are actually studying Black Lives Matter. Uh, so for a little while, Cheryl Laird, uh, she's at Bowdoin in Maine. Uh, she did a little bit of work on Black Lives Matter. I yeah, I have two projects. I have my dissertation indirectly. And I have another project that's still in the works talking about uh, police brutality here in Columbus, Ohio, uh, and whether or not, like, why was a Black Lives Matter movement, why has one been unable to uh, actually pop off here in Ohio, even though Ohio has the third highest uh, rate of police brutality and a Black police brutality incident in the nation behind New York and Florida. We're number three. No one talks about it. And why hasn't anything popped up here, popped off here? And let's see, there's a bunch of faculty. There's one at Emory that is doing a project. There's one at John Hopkins that is looking at the ways in which public administration in particular, the bureaucracy is actually further perpetuating uh, police brutality. And it's Ultimately, he argues that it's a state issue, state's issue, and that until states strive to uh, remove the barriers to uh, police accountability, that these issues will continue to happen. So he's arguing that it's a bu bureaucratic issue, a state's bureaucratic issue. I just focus on the behavior aspect. My colleague at Emory also looks at the behavioral aspects of the masses of the victims themselves. Uh... And then Cheryl Laird, when she was doing it, she was just really focusing on the incidents, the events, the protests themselves. But stay tuned. We're coming out with stuff. Stay tuned. Someday. And then, oh, yeah, we didn't, I didn't have a chance to talk about the exam. The study guide is online. It's on Blackboard. Uh, it's worth 30%. Uh, they'll be similar to the midterm, multiple choice, matching, true, false, short answer. Uh, the questions will be based on information from Black public opinion, Blacks in the media, Black women politics, and Black Lives Matter. So in that case, in comparison to previous versions of this exam, it's a lot shorter. But of course, since the lectures will be on YouTube and all that stuff, the questions, especially the short answer questions, will be a bit more intensive. So yeah. Uh, if you have any questions, yeah, it'll go live on Thursday and you will have until 11.59 p.m. Sunday to turn it in. If you find that you need more time or whatever, please let me know as soon as possible. So that way I can uh, make accommodations for you. And uh, don't forget to do the student evals. Of course, this is the first iteration of the course. If you want other people to also take it, if slash when we return to campus, your all's uh, evaluations of the course are integral to making sure that this class is offered again. So let's see. It was a I won't be here. What? But but don't you want other people to take the class, Alexis? <laughs> Alexis is like I took I just it. Have to <laughs> like I took it, and that's all that matters. But facts. If you would like other people to to have the experience that you had. I know I don't want nobody to have the experience I had. This was awful. Like, if we weren't from home, we couldn't play racial monopoly yet. I'm really bummed about that. We could not play racial monopoly. <laughs> we couldn't watch. Wait, the, uh, we couldn't play racial monopoly? Yeah. Oh, Lord. Yeah, we knew it was going to be fun. Oh. Yeah, like, uh, since there was actually enough of us, I w you would have been assigned either a black man, white man, Latino man, Latino woman. White man, white, uh, black, yeah, so black, white, Latino, man or woman. And as a result, your movements around the board would have been constrained based to your uh, race and gender. And so you would see wealth disparities happen in real time. And then, of course, you know, still trying to play and win the game of Monopoly. It's fun. And it's also a great learning tool. I enjoy playing racial Monopoly. 
because eventually I wanted to also add Asians and eventually actually do LGBTQ stuff. But that layer, if we were also talking about that, that would have been added to. Fun stuff. But of course, we didn't get to do that because coronavirus. So yeah, don't forget to do the evals. It's been a pleasure for our one senior. May the uh, employment rates as well as your student loan rates be ever in your favor. Alexis, it's been a pleasure. I need, I need Russia or China, somebody to hack into Sally Mae and just delete all <laughs> student loans for everybody. It don't matter. You get no argument out of me. All 150% co-signing, but for all of you, I'm still around on campus. I teach other courses. If you thought that I was an okay instructor, <laughs> you could take other classes with me. Don't be strange. <laughs> Don't be strangers. I mean that in all seriousness. Like if you have questions, you want to talk about like your future, other programs you're interested in, things, whatever. I'm That's around. But you ain't getting rid of me that easy. I'm moving to Columbus. You ain't getting rid of me that easy. <laughs> You're moving to Columbus? <laughs> yeah. Oh, are you going to apply for the uh, the legislature? Oh, no, no, no. Wait, aren't you going to law school? Or are you taking I'm a year off? A year or two off. Oh, so that means you should apply for that internship. You should, you should yeah. apply to be a legislative no. aide or whatever. Because I, I know people that done it. It's really cool. It ain't enough money. I got to pay rent. Not in Columbus. Like that, that, that almost $40,000 ain't enough. Nah, I got expensive taste. I might apply for it. I don't know. <laughs> no, like seriously, you should apply. Like you should apply oh. and it does not cost that much to live in Columbus, Ohio. Like I lived in a two huh? bedroom. I lived in a two bedroom off my little meager Ohio state stipend. I was in Clintonville. Okay. And I, and my stipend Ooh. was only 18,000. Now, well, I'm sure I did eat a lot of, you know, ramen, but... Them two bedrooms rent is a little high. I'm sorry. Well, I digress. I'm going to leave this alone because I know everybody's trying to go. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, the uh, yeah, like I said, the uh, the study guide is on Blackboard. Uh, please take note of the, like, exclusion. So don't worry about black and brown politics. Don't worry about policy and all those things. Uh, do pull up black public opinion from the midterm, the midterm study guide. But it's only covering those four sections. Uh, slowly and surely, I think after yeah, in between this course here, I will have the uh, YouTube videos up. They will definitely all be up and available before Thursday. And if you have any questions, send me an email. So, but yeah, that means yeah, Alexis, we should have a conversation because like yeah, if you're staying here, it ain't that it ain't that bad. It ain't that bad. <sighs> okay. So yeah, you should definitely apply. If you do apply, let me know. I actually know people. So I will go okay. like shake down my, yeah, I will shake down my resort, like my connects. Said I can help people get internships. Okay. I'll let you know for sure. All right. Uh, so happy studying, ladies. It's a shame that the men did not come, but it's been a pleasure.